Bible, Mark chapter 8 is where we're going today. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to throw the scripture up on the screen. It's also in your outline. Um, you can follow along there. Um, we're in week number four of our series called From Wounds to Wins. I think this is going to go two more weeks, and then we're going to transition into our series that leads us into Easter. Um, really quick review. I told you in week number one that healing is a process. And we said everybody understands that. Everybody understands if you break your leg, it's going to take time for that to reset. It's going to, be time, it's going to take time to heal. And, and just like you trust your doctor to lead you through that healing process, you and I, when we're, when we're recovering from, from pain and wounds and hurts and, and all of these things, whether it's the past or in the present, it's going to take time. And in that time, we have to trust God. We have to trust God in his process. Week number two, we talked about the fear that the disciples had and, and how that caused them to run from God. And when they ran, they experienced some pain and some hurt, and it opened some wounds in some of them, and, and they got confused. But we talked about how a friend loves at all times, and we talked about how Jesus calls us friends, and we talked about how Jesus is the ultimate healer. And so even in the midst of hurt, even in the midst of pain and confusion and disappointment, he's always there for us, and, and, and when we go to him, he's there to heal us. Last week, Chelsea came up here and she talked to you about even though we get stuck in messes, even though that sin can dominate our lives at times, Jesus is always there to clean up our mess. And it's important for us to remember that Jesus loves you, is always with you, and has greater plans for you. Like, I tell you that all the time. You, you've got to get that. For those of us who are followers of Jesus, our sins are forgiven. And he leads us to repentance. Like, like Jesus leads us to, to like, like the, the process is, is we feel regret. And then we get remorse. And then there should always be repentance from, from that sin. And we turn and we run away from it. And Jesus is who leads us to that. Jesus leads us to repentance because he heals us always. Today, um, I figured I'd start out by getting us all on, on common ground. Like one of the things I love to do is try to talk about things that we have in common because too much we focus on our differences. Differences divide us. Like we see that junk every single day of the week, man, whether it's politically or just whatever, the division and all that stuff is just dumb. And so one of the things I think that, that, or that I love to do is to get us on common ground so we can kind of hear the message and kind of be like, oh, that was so good or whatever. I don't, I don't know. Maybe you don't think it's good. Um, but one of the things I think that we have in common, all of us, whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, no matter where you are politically or socially or economically, whatever, is probably all of us at some point in our lives, in some way, shape, form, or fashion, all of us have, have settled for something less than the best at some point, right? You, you know what I'm talking about? Like, like you wanted A, but A wasn't available, so you took B. Like, like you, you went to Board and Arrows, and, and you found out it's a Sunday and it's closed, but you really, 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 really wanted a T-bone steak from Board and Arrows because it's aged to perfection, and it's absolutely incredible. But you went there, and it was closed, and so you thought, man, I've got to have a steak. And so you went to hy V. and it you know what I'm saying, right? Like, like we, we, we got B, and we tried to be excited about B, but you just couldn't muster up enough excitement. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, let, me, let me give you maybe a better illustration. When I was a kid, um, I wasn't too much into fashion. In fact, if you're a guy, you really didn't care too much about fashion when you were a boy. Some of you don't care about it now. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because I can just see you. Like, I just... Like, either your wife dressed you today or you look homeless. Like, those are the only two options that we got. But I'm glad you're here at Central. Love having you here. Uh, for me, probably the first time I remember really caring about fashion was in junior high. Um, when I was in junior high, there was, this <laughs> there was this jacket that came out called Members Only. How many of you remember Members Only? How, how many of you remember? Keep your hands up. Everybody look around. These are all the old people in the church. We're starting a singles or a, or a seniors ministry next. A singles, I don't know, whatever, man. <laughs> like, if you, I remember the first time I saw this. It was a little bit darker than that one. It was actually charcoal gray, and I was like, man. I've got to have one of those because in the 80s, everybody had them on TV, like, like bands had them, like they were just the cool thing. And so I had a paper route and I, I saved some money and my mom took me to the Belden Village Mall in North Canton, Ohio, and we went to this, um, this store, I think it was called like Vickery's or Victor's or something like that, but it was, it was one of those stores 
where the salespeople were paid on commission. You know what I'm talking about? There's stores like that today. The salespeople are paid on commission. Now listen, those places are absolute scams for teenage boys because there's always a hot girl working there. And the, <laughs> and the hot chick can sell you anything. Right, guys? And, and so the hot chick comes over to us and says, what can I help you with today? I'm like, <sighs> <laughs> the members only jacket. Uh. So she took us over to the jackets, and she's like, which one would you like? I was like, I want a charcoal gray one, and this is the size I need. And they didn't have my size, and they didn't have the color I wanted. And I was devastated, absolutely devastated, because I wanted that jacket more than anything in the world. I had saved and saved and saved. I had told everybody, hey, this weekend I'm going to get a members only jacket. And they're like, no, you're not. Like, yes, I am, man. I've got my mom's going to take me. I'm going to get one. And, I, I, and they didn't have it, and my mom's like, hey, we'll take you to another store. You know, there's other stores that have them. And it'll be all right. And I never will forget this. This girl looks at us and goes, you know, we have another brand of jacket. And honestly, I like it better than the members only. And then she smiled. And I completely melted, man. I was like, really? Like, what's it called? She, she said, like, men's house or men's club or members rule or something like that some of you are like i've never heard of those exactly <laughs> like horrible but she was hot and i was in middle school and so i was like mesmerized and she said i actually like these more than members only jackets and she said you know you should at least try one on so i put it on she's like Ooh, you look so good Every girl at your school is going to be checking you out. So I bought it. <laughs> that next Monday, I walked into Jackson Memorial Middle School with my charcoal gray clubhouse, men's club, whatever jacket on. And listen, middle schoolers are so aware of other people's feelings, right? I got made fun of all day long. <laughs> Look at you! <laughs> you said you were getting mad, but the only one you got! Ah! And the only reason why I got made fun of was because I settled. I knew, I knew, I knew I should have held out for members only. My mom was going to take me somewhere else to get one, but the hot girl caused me to settle. By the way, I never got one. <laughs> I ain't mad or bitter about it. I actually almost bought one for this message to wear out here and just like have it on because I thought it'd be cool, but there's nothing cool about it. There's just not. I'm just saying it, it was one of those things that I settled for in the moment. All of us have done that, right? All of us have kind of said, you know what, I'm going to do this, or I'm not going to do this, or I'm going to go here, or I'm not going to go there. And, and, and we kind of push back a little bit and, and, and in, the, in the moment because we can't have exactly what we want, we settle. Right? We, we've all done that. We, we settle. And one of the things I don't want for us as a church is I, I, I never want us as a church to settle. Not only do I not want us for a, as a church to settle, I don't want any individual in this church to settle. I don't want anybody in this place to ever settle for anything less than God's best. I just, I just don't want that for anyone. And so today, I'm going to show you this story that's told by a guy named Mark, who writes one of the Gospels. He's the Mark in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, Mark actually interviewed Peter. Um, he, who, Peter was one of Jesus' closest disciples, and that's where Mark got all of his information. And Mark tells us this story. It's fascinating. It's one of my favorite bi stories in the Bible to teach through. Um, and in this story today, I'm going to ask you three questions. At the end of the message, I'm going to put all three questions back up on the screen, and I'm going to ask you which one of these, um, you, which one of these speaks to you the most? Which one of these do you, do you need to, to focus on the most, all right? So three questions based out of this story, Mark chapter 8. Here we go. First one, who do I need to bring to Central Church? Who do I need to bring to Central Church? Notice I did not say invite. I'm not saying who do I need to tell about Central Church. Who do I need to bring? Who do I need to bring? Who do I, everybody say bring. Who do I need to bring to Central Church? Let me tell you why I'm asking this question. At the end of the day, I have a heart to reach as many people as possible with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And listen, listen, listen. I'm not just talking about good people. I'm not just talking about morally sound people. I'm talking about jacked up, messed up people reaching them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Anybody with me on this? 
Yeah, a couple of you, right? The rest of you, jump on board, because that's where we're going. L- l- look at this. Mark tells this story, and starting in verse um, 22 of chapter 8, he says, they came to Bethsaida, and some pe- th- they meaning Jesus, they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. Now, this is fascinating. Let me set it up like this. Let me ask this question. Have you ever been frustrated with someone or something? Yes, the answer is, is yes. The other morning, um, I have this dog. His name is Zeno. Some of you have met Zeno. This is him right here. Zeno is awesome. Look at that face. I know you just love him just looking at him. Zeno's my boy, man. I love Zeno. He's like my shadow. He, like, follows me around everywhere. Man, he is, he is a cool dude. But a few days ago, this cool dude, Zeno, decided at about 4.30 in the morning that he was done sleeping for the night. And so he jumped up. He's jumping on the bed. He's bringing me toys to throw to him. He's jumping on me. He's licking me. And I'm yelling at him to go away. And he's just nudging me. And he's doing all And I begin to negotiate with the dog. With a dog. I'm like, dude. 10 more minutes, man. Just give me, just, dude, just lay down for 10 minutes. Like, like he has a concept of time, right? But I'm like, come on, Z, just 10 more minutes, man, please. And, and he's having nothing. So I get up and I let him outside. He comes back in and I thought he would just like chill out, but there's no chilling out. And so I lock him in his crate. This dog started a mixture of like barking and whining and howling. I had never heard him do anything like it before. I swear to you, he was demon possessed this morning. And so I let him out. I'm like, what the heck is wrong with you? Like, I am, I am so mad. I had spent so much energy being frustrated and angry with this dog that my adrenaline was up and I couldn't go back to sleep. And so it's like 5, 5.15 in the morning, and, and I'm like, all right, man, I will play for you for like, for like five minutes. And I'm playing with him, and he's just not stopping. I'm like, you know what, I'm, I'm, just, I'm not going to do this all morning. I was going to go to work and work on the message. I'm just going to get there early and just whatever. And so I go take a shower. And I'm telling, honest to God, true story. I come out of the shower, and this dog is laying on my bed with his head on my pillow. He is loud snoring, and there's drool coming out of his mouth. I killed him. I was just like, ah! I got a little bit frustrated. Most all of us know what it's like to be frustrated with animals, right? Almost all of us, but all of us know what it's like to be frustrated with people. Now, you don't have to answer out loud, and don't point. Please don't point, and don't elbow the person next to you or anything like that. But have you ever tried to, you ever tried to help somebody, and the more you help them, it seemed like you were kind of enabling them? I mean, you you, you try to help them, and they do good for a while, then they veer off. And you try to help them, and they do good for a while, and then they veer off. And you try to help them, they do good for a while, and then they veer off. Most of us have that person or, or those people in our lives, and, and, and it frustrates us. But at the end of the day, I think one of the reasons a lot of people don't get the help they need is because what people actually need is healing before they need help. But, but they, until they get healing, they can't receive help. And they can't receive healing until they meet Jesus. And then when Jesus heals them, then they're able to be helped by Jesus and others. You say, Ryan, where do you get that from? I'm glad you asked. Look at this. The Bible said they brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. Jesus, touch him, touch him, touch him. Jesus, 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 please, please touch him. You know why they did that? Because they understood that while they could help him, they couldn't heal him. Well, like, like they, could, they could help him find a place to beg. They could help him get dressed. They could help feed him, like they could bring him his food or whatever. They could bring him his medicine. They could take him to different places. They could do all of that stuff. They could help him, but they could not heal him. And I believe at some point it clicked to them, hey, 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 we can't help him any more than we're already helping him. But we've heard Jesus can heal him. So let's take him, let's bring him to Jesus and allow Jesus to heal him. At the end of the day, that's my heart. And I hope that's your heart for this church. It's my heart that this will be a place where people, where, where people don't just get help, that this will be a place where people actually receive healing, and that we would always remember that sometimes healing takes place in an instance, sometimes it takes place over time, but at the end of the day, the fact that healing is actually taking place 
That's what really matters because we understand that Jesus, that Jesus, that Jesus heals. Here's what I find fascinating about this. In Jerusalem where they were, they had this temple, um, and it was absolutely beautiful, like big, ornate, gold all over. It's just fantastic. As you read through the Old Testament, you can read about it and see what it was like. But the temple was a place where the supernatural presence of God showed up on a consistent basis, and amazing things happened in the temple. But in order to go to the temple, you had to be perfect. Like you had to be ceremonially clean. Um, you, there were things that you could do. There were things you had to do. There were things that you couldn't do. There were certain things you had to refrain from. You had to have all of your I's dotted and all of your T's crossed. And if you were good enough, then you were allowed into the doors of the temple so that you could actually worship. So, so don't miss this. The place, the place where the supernatural power of God was, the temple, the place where the, the blind man could have been healed, he couldn't go into the temple because he was blind. Because back in that day, if you had a physical defect, the religious system of that day actually prevented you from the healing that you so desperately needed. And and when I see this, I always think about, my gosh, that's the culture in the church in America today. You can't walk through these doors unless you've got all your I's dotted and all your T's crossed. You know what I'm talking about? You want to know? You want to know where I've really learned where church and how church should be done. I've been in church work for 20 years, or in the church world, I've been in church work for about 17 or 18 of those years. But you want to know where I have really, 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 really seen over the past year how church should be done? The recovery center that I teach at a few times a week. Seriously. Like, like, I, I go into that place, and I think all the time, man, this is exactly how church should be. In recovery, man, people get in circles, and they just sit, and they talk together. Nobody is there because they have their life together. They are all there. They are all there because they are all messed up. They are all there because they are drowning. They are all there because they have jacked something up in their life. They are all there, and they, and they realize, and they admit, hey, Every one of us is screwed up. And in recovery, you you know what happens in 30 days? People get better. And you know why they get better? Because they all start at the same exact place. They all start on level ground. Nobody has to pretend that they're good. Nobody has to pretend they aren't wrestling. Nobody has to pretend they aren't struggling. And I want this to be a place where you can walk in the doors and be who you are, not pretending to be something that you aren't. I want this to be a place where we can come in saying, hey, this is who I am, and I don't want to stay this way anymore. But we can't get better if we don't admit that we need help. Now, the the thing that blows my mind in this text, the big idea that has always stood out to me, And the thing that I absolutely love is that the people who are not welcomed at the temple were always welcomed by Jesus. The people who weren't welcomed at the temple were always welcomed by Jesus. So the lepers couldn't go into the temple, but they could come to Jesus. The prostitutes couldn't go into the temple, but they could come to Jesus. The addicts couldn't come into the temple, but they could go to Jesus. The blind people couldn't go into the temple, but they could come to Jesus. The divorced couldn't go into the temple, but they could come to Jesus. The lame people couldn't come to the temple, but they could come to Jesus. Anybody could come to Jesus. And I want this to be a place where anybody can walk through those doors and have a genuine encounter with Jesus. Anybody else with me on that? Now, when I say that, as you just saw, Some people get excited, but others get a little bit freaked out by that because we all have those people in mind, right? And if those people shut those people, those those people show up, everybody freaks out. But think about this. Some of the people that you detest the most are some of the very people that might need to be in here the most. And Jesus loves them as much as he loves any one of us sitting in this room right now. And so at the end of the day, who do you need to bring to church? Listen, we will always do as much as we can to reach as many people as we can. We are not going to let this place stay small. And so if that's what you're looking for, the small church where you can just come in and do nothing, this ain't your place. 
Because I still believe that Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. And I still believe that the local church is his bride. And I still believe, even though the church sometimes can be ugly and the church can be jacked up, that the church, if you look at it in scriptures, is beautiful. And, and, and the church, only the church, can make a difference in the world, a difference that no government organization could ever make. And I believe the local church is God's plan. And if that's God's plan, that's the plan that we're going to stick to. And so there you go. Who are you going to bring to Central Church? Question number two, what work does God want to do in me? What work does God want to do in me? Here's the thing I know about every single one of us. Every single one of us, including the guy preaching right now, every single one of us has a next step. Every single one of us. As soon as you don't have a next step, you're dead. Matter of fact, you, you've heard me say that before. You, you don't have, your, your final step is going to be your step into eternity. Until then, we've all got a next step, I promise you. And so, what work does Jesus want to do in you? Now, I say that all the time, and, and here's the reason that a lot of us are afraid to ask that question. Because sometimes, what Jesus wants to do in us, if we're really going to let him do it, it's going to get messy. Now, I'll prove it to you. I want to read you this. It's going to blow your mind. When I first read this and first discovered this, it blew my mind. Verse 23, he took the blind man by the hand and led him outside of the village. Now, hold up, hold up here real quick. You've got a group of people that brings a blind man to Jesus. Jesus takes him by the hand and he leads them away from the group of people. Like there's a message here. It's actually a couple of messages here, but the one I want you to hear today is this. Some of the best work that Jesus wants to do in us, he wants to do one-on-one. -on -one. Some of the best work that Jesus wants to do in us, he wants to do one-on-one. -on -one. Listen, I'm not saying he's not going to work in this room. I'm not saying he's not going to speak to you today in this room. I'm just saying that some of the best work that Jesus can do in us, sometimes he wants to do one-on-one, -on -one, which begs the question, what are you personally doing during your week to connect with God on a consistent basis? What are you doing? What are you doing throughout the week, personally, that helps you connect with Jesus on a daily basis? Because connection, like it's all about connection. S some of you won't remember this, some of you will. There was a day, a time, when we had this thing called dial-up internet. Remember that? Everybody that remembers dial-up remembers members-only jacket. We're the old people in here. And you remember, you got on, you heard this long connecting sound. <laughs> Well, I don't. I can't do it. But then you were on, and, and somebody sent you an email. And you remember when email first came out, and you were so excited that people could send you things, and people could send you pictures, and you got an email with an attachment, and you clicked on it, and you started downloading it, and 22 minutes later, you could see the first section, and you got excited, but then somebody in the house didn't know you were on the internet, and they picked up the phone, and when they picked up the phone, what happened to the internet? You got disconnected, right? And you got mad. Probably yelled a little bit, screamed. This is central, so I know you cussed a whole bunch. But we lost connection, right? How easy, how easy is it to lose our connection with God in the world that we live in today? Like, how easy is it? I'm not judging. I, I, I'm just saying. Like, like, you know, you could be having this great day. You can, you can be experiencing the presence of God, and then you see, like, that person or you get stuck in traffic, or you get stuck in a situation, or you see the person who hurt you, or you see the person who gossiped about you, or you see the person who betrayed you, or you see the person who abandoned you, and you go from, I love you, Lord, to I hate people. Like, how do you get there, right? You get disconnected. Now, typically, um, this is where somebody will list out like 20 things to do to stay connected to God. Um, I'm telling, like I've, I've told you this before, um, figure out what's the one thing. What's the one thing that you can do throughout the week? So one thing that sets your heart on fire for Jesus. Figure that out. So one thing I do that sets my heart on fire for Jesus, and just do that every day, five to ten minutes a day. What's the one thing that sets your heart on fire for Jesus? For me, uh, I love to read my Bible. I love it, love it, love it. I've always enjoyed loving, loved reading the Bible. Um, it's what connects me. It really is. Some people, they pray for extended periods of time. I have a friend who prays for an hour every single day. I, I can't do that. I can't because I have ADD. I start praying. It's like, squirrel, 
Like, I, I'm just like all out there. I, I said that a few weeks ago about having ADD, and somebody sent me a message like, I'm so glad that you talk about stuff like that because it just lets me know that everybody struggles. I'm serious. Like, I'm not just saying it. Like, like I, can, I can go in to like a prayer meeting. I can have a list. I can be like, yes, man, I'm going to fire. I've got some music going. I'm going to pray. And I start praying, and I start going. And a couple minutes into it, before I even know what's going on, I'm counting carpet fibers, carpet fibers on the ground. Like, that's, that's what I'm doing. I just can't do it. But for you, what's the one thing that sets your heart on fire for Jesus? What is it? Is it a worship song? Like for some, getting up in the morning, listening to a worship song for about five minutes, letting those words get in your mind, that's connection. Some people, it's listening to a sermon or a podcast. Figure out what sets your heart on fire for Jesus and just do that five to ten minutes every day. Figure that out and let that carry you throughout the week. That's like, that's like Jesus taking you wanting to do work in you. Now, this is where the story gets weird. Watch this. This is Jesus, all right? Remember, this is, this is Jesus doing this. When he spit, when he spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? <laughs> Let's talk about this for a second. Let's say you're walking around today with your friends. Like, you, you, like it's gonna be nice out, and so you're walking around downtown Carroll, Lake City, Jefferson, Denison, wh wherever you're from, and you're walking around, and you see a blind guy, the group of people leading him around, and you watch a guy walk into the middle of that group and take the blind guy and pull him away from the group and go, <laughs> and then go, hey, man, you see anything? What are you going to do? You are going to, like, freak out. Like, can we all agree that's messed up? Can we all agree that that is messed up? That we'd be like, Jesus, Jesus, hold on, dog. You're the creator of the world. You can speak and things happen. You can wave your hand and things happen. But you spit on the blind guy? Come on, Jesus, like seriously? But, but you know what? This wasn't his first time. This wasn't the first time. Jesus did this before. In fact, the chapter right before this, Mark tells us this. In Mark chapter 7, verse 31, Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, through the Sea of Galilee, and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. So once again, you've got a group of people that understand he doesn't just need help, he needs healing. So they bring him, they bring him, they bring him, they bring him to Jesus, right? And they beg Jesus to place his hand on him. Jesus, 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 please, 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 just put your hand on him. Jesus, that's all you need to do. Please, just put your hand on him. Please, Jesus, we brought our friend. That's all he needs. Please, Jesus, that's all we need. Just put your hand on him, please. Here, here's the thing about healing, and we're going to talk about this maybe next week, maybe the week after that. A lot of people want to be healed, but we want to tell Jesus how he's going to heal us. And guess what? We don't get to tell Jesus how Jesus is going to heal us. We don't get to tell him. He's going to do it in his way and his time. And this is how he does it for this guy. Watch this. After he took him aside from the crowd. Remember, there's connection, right? Jesus wants to do a work in him. After he takes him aside from the crowd, <laughs> Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Stop. Can we just call this weird? Jesus is like, come here for a minute, man. Like two wet willies right here in the Bible. Now, I don't care who you are. You double wet willy me, we're going to have problems, right? Like, like, seriously. He put his fingers in the man's ears, and then watch this. <laughs> then he spit and touched the man's tongue. This is Jesus. This is beautiful, blue-eyed, blonde hair, bucket of Snickers and a hug. Jesus right here. <laughs> Can we all agree this is not necessary? He looked up to the heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Epaphatha. And th at this, the man's ears were open, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. And I'm sure he probably went, dude, what the crap was that? <laughs> like, what did you do? Anyway, that's how I read the Bible. Back here in Mark chapter 8. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? Here's the point. Sometimes healing is messy. Sometimes healing is messy. Like, like, for example, something that Jesus has been doing in, in my heart probably over the past couple of years as a parent of a teenager, a couple teenagers, is he has given me way more compassion 
and empathy for people than I've ever had. Now, in the past, I would have told you, like, I'm a pastor. I've got compassion. I'm an empathetic person. Um, But looking back, um, honestly, I was pretty judgmental. A few weeks ago, I had this conversation with someone, a younger person. They don't don't go to church here. Um, But they stopped at the gym. They saw me at the gym, and they asked me. And he told me somebody had sent him a clip of a message that I had preached a while back. And he said, hey, man, I don't, I don't want to have a conversation with you. Like, I don't want to go through a bunch of stuff. He just said, I have one question for you. And he said, I, I'm, I listened to your message, and I just want to know, so I just want to know this. Like, I'm, I'm gay. And with what I'm going through, does God love me? And I said, absolutely. He said, I'm asking because some family members told me that he doesn't. And I said, first of all, they lied to you, man. God absolutely loves you. Now, the, the, the pastoral Christian version of this is I led him to Jesus, and we formed a Bible study, and we get together at Starbucks every morning at 6 o'clock, and he's growing great, and he's sitting right here in the front row. But guess what? That didn't happen. And you know what? It's not my job. It's not my job to change him. But listen, I'm convinced that God had me in that situation because God wanted to change me. He wanted to do a work in me. And, and for me, and listen, this is, this, is, this is for me. This is for me. I don't know if this is for any of you or not. This is for me. Having messy conversations like uh, just for me, I've discovered I can learn a lot more about people by talking to them rather than talking about them. That, that's just for me. I don't know if that applies to you or not. But here's the thing. Whenever I talk about that, people go, oh, you don't believe that the Bible says the sin is stop it. Knock it off. Listen, I still have convictions, I still have beliefs, I still have thoughts on things, but at the end of the day, I have realized that the ground at the cross is level, and we all, we all, we all, everybody say all. We are all really, really, really messed up, and we all need the same amount of grace to be saved. And so at the end of the day, what do you want Jesus to do in you? Because it might might be messy, but the mess always turns into a miracle. Listen to me. If he could take a bloodstained cross and turn it into an empty room, he, or into an empty tomb, he really can, really can work out the miraculous in our lives. He really can. Which leads to the last question, number three, in what area am I settling? In what area am I settling? Is there an area of your life, maybe it's in your relationship with somebody, and you're like, oh, oh, it's not the best, man. I just, maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your career. Maybe it's a personal decision. Maybe, it, is there an area where you're settling? Where you know it's, it's, not, it's not your best. So you know it's not God's best for you. You know to make that decision is to settle. Is there an area where you're settling? This is where I get this from. This is what I love about this guy. Jesus had just spit in this guy's face and said, hey, man, can you see? And he looked up. Look at this. He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Now think about this. Don't miss this. You're blind. How do you know what a tree looks like? How do you know? There's a lot of unanswered questions in this story. I'm going to argue that this man hasn't always been blind, but the circumstances around him stole his vision. But that's another message for another time. Right here for today, I'm going to tell you, if I'm this guy and I got spit on, I'm going to be like, you know what, man? I'm good. Because in the back of my mind, I see, I say, I, I see tree people. Th- that, that's more than I saw before. I, I don't want to get spit on again. I just, I just want the mess to stop. And so you know what, Jesus? I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I'm just going to take the, the, what you got for me. I'm going to settle. I, I'm fine. And we've all been there, right? We've all been there. We've all been in the place where we want the mess to stop. We want the pain to stop. We want the hurt to stop. We want all of it to stop. I mean, we've all been in the situation where we've said, God, please just make it stop. God, please just take the pain away. God, I don't want to hurt anymore. God, just please make it go away. We've all been there, right? And right here, I love this guy. He looked up and he said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. In other words, honesty is the only way we get healing. Without honesty, there is no healing. I have people talk to me all the time. Hey, you're a pastor. Will you talk to my brother? Will you talk to my wife? Will you talk to my husband? Will you talk to my son? Will you talk to my daughter? Will you talk to my friend? Sure, why? Because they're wrestling with some sort of addiction, and I feel like they'll listen to you because you've been through it before. I want you to listen to me. I want everybody in this place to hear me. They won't listen to me. 
but you've been through it before, and you understand what they're going through. They won't listen to me. You know why they won't listen to me? The same reason that they won't listen to you. A sick person can't get better until the sick person realizes themselves that they're sick. That's the only way that healing can take place. It's the only way. It's the only way. And I love it because this guy doesn't pretend. This guy doesn't go, oh, no, man, (laughs) I'm good. He was honest with Jesus. He said, you know what, man? Things are a little bit clearer. I see see tree people, but I'm, I'm not exactly seeing clearly. He was honest with Jesus. Now, in order to do that, he had to take a risk. Don't miss that. He had to take a risk. Because in order to say that, in order to be honest, like he might get spit on again. But he didn't care. He was honest. In verse 25, once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. You know why? Because he was honest with Jesus. And it's only when we're honest that we can receive healing. And then, don't miss this, this is so good. And I don't have tons of time to go into this because I'm like way out of time on this message. But Jesus sent him in a new direction. Jesus sent him in a new direction because Jesus always sends us in a new direction. The Bible says Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. In other words, Jesus says, hey man, I know that you came to me this way, but I'm going to change your direction. Because Jesus, any time we have an encounter with Jesus, any time we have an encounter with Jesus, he always changes our direction. So how about you? Are you settling? Is there an area where you're settling? Let me kind of finish up this point like this. I don't know if you've, if you've ever noticed, I don't know if you've ever cared or not, but um, one of the things that, that I get criticized the most about, and I get criticized about for a bunch of things. I could stand up here for hours and tell you the criticisms that I get. Um, but the one, well, like one of the biggest ones I get criticized from other pastors is the fact that I love to wear jeans when I preach. Now listen, I spent years in churches where I had to wear dress pants and suits and dress coats and sport coats and ties and the whole, whole deal. And so I love, love, love wearing jeans when I preach. Some of you are like, oh, I hate it. I don't care. I love it. All right? I just do. But one of the things about me and jeans is I have a favorite pair. You will seldom see me not wearing this pair um, on a Sunday at least three times a month it's this pair. The other times, they're a slightly different color, but the same exact brand. Now, before I had this pair, there was a pair that I wore for like seven years straight. I bought them at Kohl's. I loved them. They were essentially known in my house as my preaching pants. Everybody knew, don't touch them. If daddy can't find them, he's going to lose his dang mind. Because if I can't have them, then my preaching game is all off. And I know you're like, that's weird. I know, but that's who I am. This is jacked up. And so anyway, about two years or so ago, um, they started wearing out. And we're trying to like sew them. And I had safety pins on them. And like, and I know none of you knew any of that stuff. But there came a point where like, if I wear these anymore, like things are like, it's just going to be bad. And so I went to every Kohl's in like a 100-mile radius trying to find the same pair. I had friends in Indy looking for me. I searched online, on eBay, everywhere, nothing. I could not find these pants. I freaked out. Finally, I went to Wade at Wilkie Clothiers, and I was like, dude, I need new preaching jeans. Now, Wade knew. Nobody else in the whole church knew. But Wade knew I wore the same pants every single week. Drove him nuts. Drove him even nuttier because he knew I got them at Kohl's. And so he's like, hey, man, I got these pants. Just came in. I think you really like them. So he gave me these pants. I tried them on, and they were the most comfortable jean I'd ever put on in my entire life. So I bought five pairs on the spot. Now, (laughs) I actually now have backup preaching pants. That's how weird and OCD I am on this. And listen, the reason I have so many is because these are the most comfortable jeans I have ever had. Here's the point. Don't miss this. They weren't what I was used to, but they were way, way, way better. You say, what does this have to do with Jesus? Whenever Jesus has something for you, it might not be what you're used to, but it will always, always, always be better because his ways are higher than our ways. And his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so if he's putting his finger on something in your life saying, don't settle here, it's because he wants to get you out of what you're used to and into something new that is going to be immeasurably more than you could ever ask or imagine. 
And so at the end of the day, which one of these three questions stands out to you the most? Which one? Who do I need to bring to Central Church? If a name is popping into your mind, listen to me. That's not the devil. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. That's what that is. Who do I need to bring? Number two, what work does Jesus want to do in me? What work does Jesus want to do in me? Right here again, typically we list out a whole bunch of things, but I'm not going to list out practical things because I want you to hear from Jesus. If Jesus wants to speak to you through that question, I want you to hear what work he wants to do in you. And number three, is there an area where I'm settling? Is there an area where I'm settling? And if so, would you be willing today to tell Jesus, I'm, I'm willing to step out of what I'm, I'm used to and into something new if that's your best for me, Jesus. Even if, it's, even if it's messy, even if it's messy, I'm ready for your healing hand in my life. Listen to me, healing comes from the grace of God. Grace is an amazing thing. As a matter of fact, we're gonna sing that song right now, Amazing Grace. And we're not gonna put the lyrics up on the screen. You know the song, Amazing Grace. If you don't know, listen to the person next to you because they're gonna sing, they're gonna sing loud. You'll follow along. But while we're singing, I want you to focus on those things. And I want you to ask yourself, and I want you to, I want you to talk to Jesus, and I want you to say, hey man, which one of these things, which one of these things do I need to focus on first? Which one of these things do I need to be moving ahead for? Let's stand and pray. Sing.